in the middle with power and revelation. Lord, I pray that we would hear everything that we need to hear and that it would be planted in good soil to bring forth good return. We give you glory and honor, Lord, and we ask for your blessings on Pastor Rick and on Anissa, yes. and that you would protect their children and heal the ones that are ill. Yes, Father, that you would take care of their family at home and that you would keep Anissa's heart steady yes. while she's starting to really miss her sick children. So, Lord, we just thank you for this time together, and we thank you that you are wrapping this up in a way that causes us to hunger and thirst for righteousness yes. and to want to know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor Rick. Um, we're going to do our little warm-up. We're going to put CDs and sell them. CDs, CDs. <laughs> yeah, we'll have those out, CDs and DVDs, to be out next month. So. We already had the issue with the books. <laughs> I survived the teachings of the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> I endured the teaching on the rapture, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> um, tonight we're going to do a little warm-up. We're going to talk about the rapture, and um, I, I hope even what I show. And, and by the way, on all these subjects, whether it was why do we study prophecy, um, whether it was the historical prophetic events that were that were prophesied in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus, and then the ones that will only fulfill that is second coming and, the, and some in the, in the timeline that is developed in between, uh, which we took actually two nights to work on. And then um, talking about um, the, the wars and the, the, some major events and, and earthquakes and famines and difficulties uh, that are going to happen around it. All of it points to rem remembering that all of it is about just the love of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we study prophecy, it's not doom and gloom. Though there are difficulties and challenges that happen in our world, they're all indicators of the, the fulfillment of, of the sign, which is the preaching of the gospel throughout the entire world. And we don't put our heads in the sand because we see the days approaching. As we see the day approaching, getting closer and closer, Jesus says, look up, your redemption draws nigh. And that's not the time. How many of you know if you've ever ran a race, when you see the finish line, you don't stop and, and, and sit down, you sprint towards the end. And as we're looking at the end, the Spirit of God is calling us to sprint towards the end, to proclaim the gospel, walk in signs and wonders, uh, walk in the power of, of deliverance over demonic uh, spirits and entities, and just walk in the power of God's love and God's grace. Now more than ever, we need to, we need to be, understand the righteousness that's been given to us in Jesus Christ, and not let the devil bring any lies or any, any distractions to our life, because in fact, uh, eternal lives, the, the eternity of lives depends upon it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why we study prophecy. A lot of people say, well, you're wasting your time. Don't worry about studying prophecy. That's absolutely ludicrous. Everything in the scriptures points to Jesus in one form or another. And studying end times prophecy is just as valid as studying ways to develop your character, yeah. take care of your marriage. Um, you know, equip your children, raising your children in a godly home, mm -hmm. studying prophecy. In fact, what sets the Bible apart from any other religious writing, as I've said over and over again, is the fact that it's prophetic. There's no prophecy in the Quran. There's no prophecies in the Quran. It's just a, a list of books and rules and, and, and di dictation. There's no prophetic words uh, in the writings of Confucius. There's good moral teaching, and some of it overlaps with what the Bible says is good moral teaching. But there's nothing prophetic or li alive about it. The Bible is the only book that has prophecies for history was written ahead of time. It's written beforehand, and it's unfolding exactly as God's Word says it is. So it's, it's, in fact, Peter says it would do you good to study the prophetic Word until the revelation of Christ rises in your hearts to a greater and deeper level. Amen. So again, and we know, we also know that studying prophecy puts our minds off of ourselves off of the circumstances of the world despite we're paying attention to it and puts our minds upon our expectation and our hope of the soon return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And this is what we're doing. Um, so we're going to talk about the rapture tonight. But I also want to, uh, last night I wanted to talk about, we're going to do a little warmer upper, um, a little um, pattern, another pattern that we find in Scripture. I don't know if anybody, if you've heard this, it's okay. It's a great little uh, teaching on the gospel. Um, laid out in Genesis chapter 5 in the genealogies of Adam. So uh, we're going to start by going to Genesis chapter 5. And if 
to go to Genesis chapter 5. We're going to read through the genealogy of Adam. Um, and it's pretty much the entire chapter. So I'll just go ahead and read it. And let's pay attention to a couple of, of names and scenarios. It says, uh, chapter 5, This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in, it, in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, blessed them, and called them mankind in the day that they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness, and after his image, and he named him Seth. So Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth. And after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. And all the days of Adam total were 930 years, and then he died. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. And after he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and, and had sons and daughters. And so all the days of, Seth, days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years, and he begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And that's now that now we're the third down from Adam. And Canaan lived 70 years, and he begot Mahalalel. And after he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had sons and, uh, and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and he begot Enoch. It's interesting, by the way, that in the book of Enoch, uh, Donna asked about the book of Enoch. In the book of Enoch, it says that the watchers, the fallen ones, uh, during the days of Jared, that's when they landed on Mount Hermon. They came down to Mount Hermon during Jared's days. Uh, again, Enoch is not in the 66 books of the biblical canon, but it is quoted multiple times in, uh, by New Testament authors as a reference. So it gives us an idea of understanding of what they really believed in the, uh, in the, in the, in the context of Enoch to include it as... Uh, a, a piece of writing that influenced what they wrote down as inspired by the Holy Spirit. So anyway, that's a little side note. So study, the book of Enoch is worth a look and a study. Um, but I would make sure that you get a good commentary around it and don't just take everybody's word for it. So uh, some people write stuff about it that's, that's not appropriate um, and not accurate. So anyway, Enoch walked, so, so all the days of Enoch, let's see, after he begot, where was I? Jared. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Um, so Enoch, it's interesting, is going to be one of our first examples of the rapture, and he was the seventh from Adam, a completion. So he was the seventh generation. Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. In fact, and in the book of Hebrews, it reiterates the fact that God took him to heaven. He just, he never died. He just was walking and then went to heaven. Let's go. So Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. And, he, and after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. And Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then goes into the story and the account of God sending the flood, commissioning Noah. So, and we know that at the end of Noah, God floods the earth, isn't that right? <clears throat> Destroys um, mankind and starts over with Noah. Um, so, let's see. Noah, Noah, so, I want to just look here really quick and show you this little tidbit that within the genealogies from Adam to Noah, if you were to take their names, translate them into the Hebrew, there's a pattern that shows up, which is very telling. Uh, and so I want to do that. So 
let's look at this really. Adam is really simply, his name means man, right? Adam means ruddy, red, or man. But in particular, it means man. The name Seth is appointed. His name means appointed in the Hebrew. Enosh is mortal. Kenan, again, this is a direct line. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel, his name means the blessed of God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. <coughs> Methuselah means his, his death shall bring. This is really neat because actually if you see it, Methuselah lived longer than uh, Lamech and, and Lamech died before Methuselah did and so Noah, the flood didn't happen until Methuselah died. So uh, that's an interesting little comparison between these, this particular generation of people. Um, and then Lamech means the despairing. And then Noah's name means rest. So if you sit here and just read the names, what you have, and, and again, this is uh, a man by the name of Chuck Missler. Anybody heard of Chuck Missler? He's the one that did this. He, he outlined this first before uh, this is the first place I ever heard it, and I've loved it. I like to teach it as a uh, just a real neat little warm up. And if, if you read these in order, just reading their names, it means man. You could even put a little. He has appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed of God, though, shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing rest. Wow. That's <clears throat> just by looking at the, there's a couple of other places where just you know you read through the Bible and you're like so and so we got so and so and so and so we got so you're like what's the point? <laughs> you know, a little bit of study, a little bit of a little bit of crosswording, a little bit of uh, uh, what's the name of that other game? You know the math the puzzle game. Sudoku, a little Sudoku, a little bit of putting things together, you can find patterns like this. In fact, the, the, the Jewish rabbis spend all day long looking for these types of patterns uh, held within the Hebrew Scriptures. And they spend hours at the table all day long talking and trying to discover these patterns. But it's amazing. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed of God shall go, come down teaching, and his death shall bring the despairing rest. Which is, of course, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Right here in the midst of it. Isn't that very neat? I'll leave that up there. You can write that down. So we'll flip over to the rapture. This little warm up. Okay. You hear the story about the man who was uh, very, very upset, going to end his life, so he goes off to this bridge and he stands there on the edge of the bridge and he's getting ready to jump in and commit suicide because it's like his life is not worth living. Another gentleman comes walking by and he says, what are you doing? He goes, I'm, I'm going to commit, I'm going to end it all. My life is just absolutely not worth living. He said, why do you want to do that? There's so many things to live for. Don't you know that God loves you? And the man on the edge goes, oh, are you a Christian? Well, yes, I am. So the man goes, are you a Christian? And the guy on the edge says, well, yes, I am. He goes, well, what, you know, what, what's your, what kind of Christian are you? Well, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> and then the guy, the guy on the street goes, what kind of Baptist are you? Southern Baptist or missionary Baptist? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm Southern Baptist. Oh, good! So am I, says the guy on the street. He goes, uh, are you, uh, you know, the Southern, you know, are you the conservative Baptist, uh, a Southern Baptist conservative or Southern Baptist liberal? Well, I'm Southern Baptist conservative. Oh, so am I, says the guy on the street. You know, are you an amillennial, do you, do you believe in the amillennial uh, reign of Jesus Christ or the premillennial return of Jesus Christ? Well, I believe in the premillennial return of Jesus Christ. Well, oh, good, so do I. 
Now, are you? Do you believe in the in the rapture of the church? I do. Yes. So do I. Do you believe in the pre pre trib or the mid tribulation of the rapture or the post tribulation? Well, I'm a pre tribulation rapturist. And the guy walks up to him, pushes him off, and says, "Die, heretic, die." <laughs> <laughs> Because you know what, if you talk to anybody about the rapture of the church, you're going to get a million people, and some people believe, and I don't want to say this before we start, some people believe that when you start talking about the rapture, that it's a reason to end relationships in the church. It seems crazy, but there are people that believe, if you believe in the rapture, then you're going to go in the rapture, and if you, believe in the, if you don't believe in the rapture, even though you're a Christian, you won't go when the rapture happens. Some people believe that if you teach the pre-tribulation rapture, that you're setting people up to fail. If the rapture doesn't happen, they're going to be disappointed and lose their faith when, when the tribulation comes. And I just think that those types of arguments about <coughs> separating in the church or making those fine lines over the doctrine, this is not a life and death doctrine. Uh, and by doctrine, I mean a teaching in the church. Uh, but I do believe that the Bible clearly teaches the rapture. Um, that is without a shadow of a doubt. Most, most believers, most Many theologians will say that the rapture is in the church. Very few people will say that, or in the Bible, very few people will say that it's not. Um, but the rapture is very clearly taught. When the rapture happens is where people start making these fine lines. I'm not going to tell you where it starts, but I'm going to tell you what I strongly believe when the rapture happens prior to the tribulation of the saints. And we've discussed some of that already uh, in the previous lessons leading up to this point. Uh, but I do believe there's very clearly a pattern of the church of God, the church of Christ, the bride of Christ being taken away um, out of the midst of the world before the, 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 before the, the son of perdition, uh, before the, the antichrist, and before the day of trouble for the nation of Israel happens. The bride of Christ is taken up out of, our, out of the midst of the earth because... The bride of Christ, the church, is bearing the government and the authority of Jesus Christ on the earth. Is, are we not? Right. In other words, who's God's voice on the earth right now? Yeah. The church, the believers. We may not be in all the political positions. We may not be in, in every influential place uh, in government. Uh, but what we are is a force of people that are the temple of the living God. We carry around the authority. We literally, evil is not advancing on the earth because the believers are containing the spirit and the presence yeah. and the word of God and walking in the authority of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's it. And all we have to do is live our lives in Christ. We are exuding the power of the gospel. We are bringing heaven to earth. Isn't that what Jesus yeah. prayed? Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. That while we have Christ in our hearts, the King reigning in our hearts, heaven is in our hearts, and we are now the conduits of heaven while we're here on earth. The only way evil can ultimately um, have any kind of a day is that the church has to be removed as a force and as a restraining uh, from allowing evil or the ultimate, the day of the Antichrist to come. That's why I strongly believe that the, the Antichrist will, is destined to come, is prophesied to come, but he can't come as long as the church is here, because the church is the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, the saints of God, and while we're here, we can't manifest to its full potential. Simply because where light is, darkness can't be. Amen. So God needs to take us out, allow His sovereign prophetic plan to unfold, God. and then He brings us back with Him at the end of the seven-year period. Again, we went through these when we broke down the timeline a couple of sessions ago. So far, so good? Okay, so... I'm going to talk about, uh, again, the criticism of the rapture. I'm going to talk about the, you know, the, church, uh, not, uh, the church fathers. The church fathers and the rapture. I'm going to quote, there's a lot of people that say the rapture is a fairly recent teaching in the church, but it began in the 1800s. And prior to that, it wasn't spoken of. I'm going to quote three, at least three church fathers, never mind the Bible scriptures we're going to quote, but three church fathers that referenced it in the early, uh, in, two, in the 250s and 300s. Um, 
in, in that day. I'll, I'll bring those up when I quote them. And then we're going to talk about what the Bible says about it. And, and, and the pattern of the rapture, which we touched on last night. And we'll go into more in-depth and we'll look at those in particular. <coughs> the patterns of the rapture. And we will go from there. Okay, so with that, let's get into some of this stuff. Um, just as a reminder, since, since we got to all this, remember that there is a time coming from the cross at some point there's a seven year period, right? We said from the time of the decree going forward in Daniel by, Ar by Artaxerxes until the rebuilding of the temple or un until the rebuilding of the temple would be 49, would be 49 years and from there there would be another 400 and uh, how many seven sevens? This would be um, seven, seven, seven. Seven, seven sevens and then 62 sevens, which is seven times so 434. So it all points out to 483 years total, at which point, 483 years from the decree of Artaxerxes, the Messiah would be cut off. And we showed you that according to the Daniel chapter 9, it was literally uh, 483 years <coughs> of Jesus being crucified. That, that, and that when Jesus was going in to Jerusalem to be crucified, the Pharisees knew that everybody was looking for the Messiah because they had counted the 483 years and they were waiting for the Messiah. That's why they told Jesus, I tell you, you know, when they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and laying down the palm branches. And they said, Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. People might actually think you're the Messiah. He said, listen, if I told them to be quiet, even the rocks would cry out. There was an expectation that people, the nation of Israel, was looking for the Messiah to deliver them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. Jesus was the Messiah, but first to come as a lamb, to die for the sin of all mankind, secondly to come um, as the judge of the earth, riding on a great white horse to bring judgment to the planet. And so Daniel and the angel had this discussion, 483 years and at the cross, but there was a, another seven-year period that, that this kind of interrupted that last seven year period of judgment and that would be placed down, we're still got to go through it but it's going to be placed at the end of the age of the church it's going to be placed at the end so that um, Israel will be Israel will be judged and he says that three and a half years through that, the Antichrist will be revealed and that really during this time the, the seals in Book of Revelation, uh, the the, the uh, trumpets of the Book of Revelation would blast, and the bowl of judgments, and all of these were judgments of, of wrath upon the earth. Once God was ready to use the 144,000 Jews to declare as kings and priests of the message of God as King and Lord, they would receive Jesus Christ as Messiah. And that the church, which was which was gone from 33 A.D. to whenever this seven-year period starts, which is 2,000 years now, and at some point the, the church, which is Jew and Gentile, come together and each one body becoming the bride, would be taken out of the picture, go to heaven, um, caught up in the clouds with the Lord, and then God would now say, it's time to put the Jews back in the ball game. And they become the quarterback to the third in the in the fourth quarter. The third quarter, the the church is the sort of the the, the quarterback in the game of, of life, the game of the game of God's plan. The church gets pulled out of the game, goes to heaven, they're on the sidelines with the Lord, and then God puts Israel back in as the quarterback to finish the race, to finish their full commission that he commissioned them. And that would be for this seven year period right here. We went through a lot of this over the last couple of weeks, so we're going to give that as a review. And so this moment where the church gets pulled up here to heaven is called the catching away. Or the rapture of the church. Okay? Um, by the way, the Bible describes a seven-year period on the, on the earth which, where wrath is being poured out. And the church is the bride of Christ. And there is a correlation between the bride of Christ um, in a Jewish wedding. A Jewish wedding lasts seven days. And so, there's a correlation to the bride of Christ 
going through the wedding supper of the Lamb for that seven year period while we're in heaven, outside and away from all of this uh, supernatural tribulation. Not regular tribulation that people have to go through in life, the ups and downs, but the tribulation where God's wrath is literally being poured out upon a, a world that has rejected Jesus, has rejected the Messiah. Um, so, there will be people getting saved and born again, i.e., through the Jewish people, but it will be mostly, you know, as that wrath and that judgment's coming down, and it'll be 144,000 Jewish people who have the revelation of Jesus Christ as their Messiah that will be evangelizing the world at the time. And they'll be sealed and protected from all the judgments. Okay? Um, again, all of that is in the book of Revelation. So let's talk about the idea that there's a rapture and that they get taken away out of this seven-year period. Now, uh, uh, there are some that believe that, the, again, this would be pre-tribulation rapture. Some that believe that halfway through when the Antichrist gets revealed, then the rapture happens. So that would be those that believe that the rapture happens midway through or the middle of the tribulation rapture or mid through. Then there's people that believe that the church has to go through the, the wrath of God and go through the tribulation so that she can be refined of God and be a pure bride and go through the suffering so they can be somehow be deemed as pure and holy at the end of suffering, and then they would be at the end or post-tribulation. The rapture happens, and then we return immediately with Jesus Christ to take a break. These are the three theories of when the rapture would happen. Before the tribulation, which is pre, in the middle of the tribulation, which is mid-trib, or after the tribulation, which is post-tribulation. Um, So we'll go with that. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. Paul. Okay. Right. Right. Now let's talk about the dispensation of Can the Holy Spirit. Question? Yeah, she's asking when the church leaves, is the Holy Spirit still going to be operating upon the earth? Um, and this is a good question. This has caused a lot of confusion on how and why uh, the working of the Holy Spirit. Let's remember something unique. When did the Holy Spirit, has, prior to the church being established, when you read through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit would come, the Holy Spirit, like let's just say Samson, for example. When Samson was in trouble, the Holy Spirit came upon Samson. External force. Exactly. There, he was, it was externally came upon him. Um, and the prophets prophesied when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Um, uh, David sang and, and worshipped when the Holy Spirit came upon him. There's always this external, he always comes in and says, why could not the Holy Spirit, well when the church came, then the Holy Spirit came inside. He is with you. He's not with you right now, Jesus said, but, but when I'm gone, He's going to come in. He's going to be, He's with you. You know Him. You recognize Him out here. But He's going to come and dwell within you after I leave. Prior to the Jesus on the uh, blood on the cross, the Holy Spirit couldn't dwell inside anybody. He could only come up on them. Why? Because when Jesus died, His blood made us pure by faith. So now that we were pure on the inside, He could take up residence on the inside. Prior to that, the faith we could look forward to it, so he would honor that by coming up on God's people to activate them, to prophesy, or to activate them in strength, or to activate them in wisdom from the external, but not from the inside. When the church was born at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit dwelled on the inside. Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed upon them. Well, isn't it true that the, the temple was destroyed, and so now we have the temp We are rebuilding the temple again, and we defend us by the whole power of the Holy Spirit. Well, we are the temple right, of the Holy saying. Spirit. Yes. Because the temple is no longer, so the Jews have to look. We should represent.